Hey, Desert listeners, Love is Blind, Season 2, Episode 10. Let's watch. I do. Yeah, it made sense. That's what I would have predicted, I guess. And his I do seemed a little uh, lackluster, but, you know, an I do is an I do, right? Um, by the way, I, some people are commenting on how much he's sweating. And if I were up there and it's a hot day, that, that would have been me. I all For some reason, all my sweat glands are in my head, um, not on the rest of my body. I don't know why. But that's the way it is. I have brothers and sisters and cousins who also have this. I don't know if it's a half Japanese thing or something, but it's just like just drenched. So, you know, I can relate. But anyway, all right. So they're going to get married. And I guess we'll see how they do together. How does this show work? We don't get to see. They do like a reunion, right? And then we get to hear a report. So maybe they'll do another Love is Blind, you know, aftermath. Uh, we <laughs> That might be interesting to see. But okay. Yeah. Well, hopefully they, and I've heard people have emailed me saying that Danielle is in therapy. Hopefully the two of them go to therapy. It's very workable. It, it's not dire if they have help from the outside. If they don't have help, I, it is, it does concern me. But all right, so they're going to get, they are married now. <laughs> Whatsoever that you are the person I'm supposed to be with, I'm glad that I found you and I can't wait to spend the rest of my life being better together. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So she says, thank you. And that's great. She's, but it's in line with my hypothesis about her that she, her self-esteem is um, not great based on her life experiences and has a schema that she doesn't deserve love. And we've seen evidence of that. And that I don't know if that thank you is a part. You know, it's like, thank you for saying I do when you would hope that she would say, damn straight, I'm a catch or, or I don't know. Something, anyway, she's saying thank you, that's nice, but in the scheme of everything else we've seen, it it has that potential uh, under, underpinning that makes me feel bad for Danielle. Ooh. I didn't realize it for the rest of our lives, I should have thought this through a little more. <laughs> I love you. I love you too. I will say that their love and mutual infatuation seems to be there, which can help to bond and provide patience. I mean, I don't know. We saw escalation of conflict throughout their, how long have they been together at this point? It's about a month, I think. So, uh, but they do seem bonded and this is a nice moment. Their strengths are that Nick can show patience in the face of conflict, which can be obviously is a good thing, but he's not always patient. She can be differentiated and take responsibility and look at her feelings and look at herself and say, oh, I'm having one of those things again. But, you know, the things that are working against them is that she sometimes falls into a deep, she spirals and can seemingly become quite dysregulated, which will distort her perceptions of self and others. And we're, so there's an all good, all bad thing that happens for some people. I don't know if Danielle is one of these individuals, but that is retained from childhood. When we're very, very young, zero to three-ish, we tend to see everything in black and white. It's either I'm all good or I'm all bad, or my parents are all good or my parents are all bad. And the one of the ways this manifests is that when you're with a two-year-old and you're happy times and everything's going well for the two-year-old, they worship you and everything is great. But as soon as you aggravate them, like it's bedtime or nap time, or you're not going to give them a second cookie, or you're not going to let them play with your cell phone, or it's time to go away from the playground or whatever it is, then you become all bad to them. They're not just upset at you temporarily in their minds. In their minds, you are the enemy to the point where sometimes they will literally hit you. Now, a two-year-old hitting you isn't very powerful and so it's it's kind of cute can be a little aggravating but they you know if they were bigger they would haul off and hit you because you are in their way you're all bad you are the enemy how did you go from being the all loving mother to the all hateful mother <laughs> and and that's because children have that black and white way of thinking it changes over time and it's slowly as they start to develop and learn 
and integrate the two versions of the parent that they have. And this is all this all goes back, this conceptualization goes back to the early 20th century with Melanie Klein and object relations folks. Anyway, point is, is that uh, we sometimes because of abandonment or relational traumas or mistreatment early in life, we retain that all good, all bad. And we also have that about the self. When, when we're two years old, we also have an all good, all bad conceptualization of the self where we just think we can do anything. We're the best ever. And then when something goes bad for us, we think we're the worst person on the planet and our self-esteem falls through the floor. Over time, we learn that we're mostly good with some flaws. We learn that other people are mostly good with some flaws. We integrate those two experiences, the all good, all bad, become just the person, and there's they're mostly good and there's some bad. So when we are adults and we retain that way of thinking because we weren't allowed to develop past that phase, then in relationships, sometimes when we get into conflict, we start to look at ourselves and say something, you know, whenever we enter into a conflict with our partner, there's always a question mark about us. We, we have a question mark that emerges for us. It's like, am I to blame? Am I wrong? Am I a bad person? Did I just, was I just unfair? Am I not good enough? You know, is this, I'm asking this person to be nicer to me. Are they not being nicer to me because I'm not good enough? So there's a question mark, am I not good enough? And if you have this black and white thinking and there's a question mark about am I not good enough and you don't have a defense of narcissism or something to get out of it, then you just go to, I'm all bad. I, I am, I, I'm not mostly good with some flaws. I am all flaws. I, there's nothing good about me. And you slip into that mode of I'm all bad. Maybe even the other person is all bad too. And if you, and it's not just like a, it's not just like a, a um, an intellectualization. It is a felt sense. You are convinced. I am horrible. No one will ever love me. Everyone else is horrible. No, you know, they're all bad people. I'm a horrible person. I can never trust anyone. It's, it's never going to work out. Now, all of us can slip into that. All of us have that potential of slipping into that black and white thinking when we're under great stress. But if you have those relational traumas from early in life, you slip into it very easily under very mundane circumstances. Like you don't get a text back or someone's late or they, they scrunch their eyebrows at you when you're talking to them or whatever. And boom, all bad. They're all bad. I'm all bad. One or the other or both. And then you just feel like you're nothing. No one's ever going to love you. You're just a piece of crap. And then you then you feel even worse about yourself, right? So, yeah. If you have that, it makes it really hard to navigate a relationship, right? Because in order to navigate a relationship, when there's tension, you have to be able to hold on to a truth that me and this other person are mostly good with some flaws. And I might be bumping into some of those flaws in myself and the other person, but I can rely on a larger portion of this person and myself of being a good good enough person and a, a, a trustworthy individual. You have to have that faith. It's a faith, you know, because in the middle of a conflict, there might not be any evidence that you're good or the other person is good. So it's a faith, it's a belief system, and it's a felt sense. And if you don't have that, it becomes very hard to navigate a relationship and navigate the normal tensions that happen in a relationship. Today is not just about me, it's about Tipti also. They say you have to be selfish and think about yourself. And I think that's true in, in many scenarios. But I, I also think, you know, when it comes to marriage, that's, that's the day you stop thinking about just yourself. Wait, what? So he's saying, you know how they say you're supposed to be selfish and think about yourself. When? <laughs> I mean, I suppose, yeah, I mean, yeah, I'll even tell that to people. I'm just like, look, uh, you're at work, for example, and they're, you know, working you to the bone. And your boss is like, please don't leave. And you're like, this job is ruining my life. Yeah you should at least consider your feelings and be quote unquote selfish. But I don't know how that applies. Maybe he's saying I need to be selfish and think about what's good for me. Uh, but 
what's good for you is good for her. And because if you're thinking, I don't want to be with her, she doesn't want to be with you. I, I don't understand what he's saying there. You know how much you mean to me and the impact that you've made on my life. But no, I cannot marry you. Okay, interesting. I wonder what the reasons are. I don't blame her. I think she knows. I don't even, have they even kissed each other? <laughs> I, I don't know. So from her standpoint, she's like, yeah, I mean, I want to be with someone who wants me in, in all the ways, not just a couple of the ways. So, okay, yeah, I mean, it, it's good. The two of them probably should be dating other people. That's, that's good, yeah. I deserve somebody who knows for sure. So I'm choosing myself and I'm gonna say no. Now, do you have to drag everyone to a wedding? <laughs> Just, uh, I'm guessing you, they both could have said that, I'm guessing, days or not, about weeks ago. But, you know, it's a show, so it's more dramatic to that way. If I was one of the friends, I'd be like, oh, I, got, <laughs> I got all gussied up for this and all excited, and I don't know. But then sometimes I wonder if they tell the family beforehand. I mean, certainly the parents didn't seem shocked by what was happening, so hopefully the parents knew, the family knew. He's not the one for me. Because if he was, he would make me feel like I was the one, and he never did that. Okay, he never made her feel like he was the one or she was the one. Yeah, he was extremely open about his ambivalence about it. So, yeah, yeah, it's good. I think it's, just, it's good. Now, could they have both said yes and had that also have been okay? Yeah, absolutely, if, if they were up for the difference in the kind of relationship that it would have been. But uh, yeah, it makes sense. We're still good though. Yo, this is a celebration. This is a celebration. That's the last thing I'm gonna say. Let's run it, let's run it. Here we go, baby, everybody up, everybody up, here we go. So is he just nervous? Cause this is kind of awkward. <laughs> a celebration of what exactly? Well, earlier he said, you know, no matter what, today's a celebration of love. Okay, I don't know if everyone sees it that way. <laughs> is this his DJ nature coming out? He wants to, he's used to getting the you know, crowd pumped. I don't know. It looks awkward to me, though. It, 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 to me, I would have thought he just would have walked off like she did. They could have even walked off together because we're, ah, we're friends. <laughs> Let's just walk off together. My sweetheart. We're going to be partying through till tomorrow because I don't work till Monday. She so, uh, what's happening right now? Uh, we're gonna let's party. So, I don't know. Now maybe him and Deep, Deep D already had a conversation about all this. Is he taking it seriously? Uh, we don't know what happened behind the scenes, but it certainly doesn't. It's not a good look. I think to be appropriate to the situation, you maybe go to her and say, "Hey, you, you know, I, I get it." It makes sense that you said no, and I just want to say um, I probably would have said no too. So it's it's a good I, or I didn't know what to say, and so you saying no just kind of helped me. And you know, uh, uh, treating the situation for what it is instead of let's party. Well, definitely be my friend. You'll definitely be my friend. I'm sad. Part part of me is upset. Part of me is upset, but like. It's a net positive. Like overall, there's so much more positive emotion. I mean, you know, uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it just seems so, I, I, in these situations, I don't know if it's culturally out of place, not only for weddings or a situation like this, but for a show like this. We've seen other scenes like this on the show or on other shows. And typically, there's more of a somber reaction from the individuals. But, uh, you know, it does make me wonder if they, if he, if the two of them had already, because I, I, so if he's taking this in a very callous, glib way, uh, then, and if Deep D were hurt by, and I, maybe we'll find out if she's just like, I don't understand. I, I thought he'd take this more seriously. So we'll find out then that would indicate some sort of callousness or decep deception that he was up to where he's just like, yeah, in his mind, he's like, 
I never intended on being with her, so let's party. Everyone's here, all my friends, and da da da. Um, or did the two of them already know? And he's he was thinking, does he feel bad that he dragged everyone there? I mean, I could see that being a factor. He drags everyone there, and then he's trying to kind of. Okay, so because they've talked about on the show, other couples have talked about how they've talked about what they're going to say in the altar, which makes total sense. You should talk with your partner about what you're going to say, unless it's pretty obvious that it's going to be a yes. You should clarify prior to getting on. You know, it's a courtesy. So uh, it's a. So I think that they might have already had that conversation, and so he's thinking, well, I've got to play along with the show, so I have to invite everyone there. I can't talk about what I really feel because I, I want people to have a natural reaction. The producers might have even told him to do that. And then he feels like crap, and then she walks off. He pays respect to that, and then he's like, hey, everyone, let's party. Every, you know, this is a celebration of love because he feels guilty for having dragged everyone there. <sighs> Am I just giving him too much credit? I don't know. Let me know in the comments. Yeah. Yeah. It's probably for the best, man, you know? She she did her thing, and I would much rather be like, dude, I sh thank God, thank God I didn't have to say anything and you know and like very transparent i was the one that was more on the fence okay so he's saying thank god i didn't have to say anything you know thank god she said no and that saved me from having her to say yes and me say no um yeah it just seems like not really respecting the situation it seems to be like he doesn't really care like it was this no big deal like he was never really invested or he doesn't really viscerally understand what's happening but I don't know I don't know I, I'd have to talk with we have to know what Deep D would say if she was like look I get it he, he we talked about it before or I understand his reaction He he's just kind of a happy partier kind of a guy I'm fine with that or would she see this and say like Oh my God, he he doesn't even care at all. Uh, I wonder what she would think. Like, you know what I mean? It's not a fun thing to talk about right now, but like, if I would have said yes, she would have said yes. Yeah. That's why I feel amazing. We got, we avoided all of that. I was like, please be the one to reject me. Wait, 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 let's rewind this. So he's saying if she would have said yes, I would have said yes. But then he just said earlier, thank God she said no, because then that saves me from having to say it. So either he's confused he is lying to others, he's lying to himself, or he truly doesn't know how to make decisions on his own that are of this significance, where he's just like, I just leave, I just, and we can imagine that. So the way that he comes across, Shake comes across is, you know, super confident guy who knows his himself, but you can come across that way and still be extremely indecisive and, and not know yourself and have a really hard time making decisions for fear of criticism, for fear of making a mistake, for fear of whatever. And uh, so I don't know, but let's rewind that because I think this is interesting. She did her thing and yeah. I would much rather be like, dude, I sh thank God, thank God I didn't have to say anything. And you know, and like very transparent, I was the one that was more on the fence. Like, it's, like, you know what I mean? It's not a fun thing to talk about right now, but like, if I would have said yes, she would have said yes. Yeah. Oh, I, I, he said, to be honest, if I would have said yes, she would have said yes. Okay. Well, I, I think that given what we saw, that seems like an honest disclosure. But yikes, dude, why are you saying that in this context? publicly right at the wedding like hey just i just want everyone to know that when she said no it's really about me that i i she knew that i might say no so that's why she said no but if i would have said yes then she would have said yes we did, everyone understands that she didn't say no to me she would have said yes she only said no because she thought i was on the fence or that you know that's a pretty bad look <laughs> like why would some things are piling up here that are showing that he either doesn't really fully grasp what's happening 
at least to maybe a lot of onlookers, or he doesn't care. I feel amazing. We got, we avoided all of that. I was like, please be the one to reject me. Like, I can handle it. I can take it. You know? <laughs> so laughing about it, please be the one to reject me. I can handle it because I don't want to feel the guilt of having to say no to you. Even though you did, prior to the altar, say no to her, there must have been some kind of conversation or at least a very firm message to her that he was very likely going to say no. So the fact that, he, like, just, um, yeah, either he's confused or he doesn't care or... Or him and Deep D processed this days ago, weeks ago, and he's just, or he feels guilty that he dragged everyone there. I don't know. <laughs> It'll be fine. Honestly, right now, I'm excited to just get back in the normal swing of things. I want to get back into my fitness routine and, and um, not have reservations at Nobu on Sunday, so things are going to be good. Okay. So, full circle. <laughs> We've come all the way back to that beginning few scenes with Shake where, I mean, it's not fully back, but it's in that, it's in that zone of where he was talking about, uh, you know, you're 33, I'm, you know, I'm 32, you're th I don't usually date older women. She's 33, you're 32. <laughs> uh, I, I, how, you know, how, could I, could I carry you on my shoulders at a, at a show? That kind of stuff. Um, I'm used to dating, you know, super hot people, da, da, da. At his wedding, where he knows, in essence, she was willing to say yes, but because you were on the fence or were going to say no, she said no. So really, you rejected her, which is fine. You know, that's, that's okay. Um, you can want what you want, but you rejected her. She was, as you said, she was up to marrying you. And you rejected her. And at the wedding, she said no, She said no. but you understand, and you're telling everyone, it wasn't her saying no, it was really me saying no, that you treat it that way. And then you say, I have reservations at Nobu? Who cares? <laughs> what? I mean, it's like we're seeing a real, uh, I mean, I, Bateman, what's his name from uh, American Psycho? It's that kind of talk. Like, well, you know, I, I let's rewind. What? No. <laughs> It'll be fine. Honestly, right now, I'm excited to just get back in the normal swing of things. I want to get back into my fitness routine and and um, I have reservations at Nobu on Sunday, so things are gonna be good. Well, they edited that pretty clearly. There was at least space in between what he said right there. Maybe they asked him like, what are you gonna do this weekend? And he's like, well, I got reservations at Nobu. It's still not a good look. And so I don't think it really was that way. But why would you even be bringing that? And when we see the whole thing put together, it's, we're seeing, okay, so what's the story of Shake? <laughs> Is it that he's immature and in the beginning was, you know, had the perspective of a teenager, one that looks for prestige, one that, I mean, not all teenagers are like this, but when you're, when you're younger, you're more likely to have insecurities that result in needing to look for really desperate acts to bolster your self-esteem, like uh, dating for self-esteem reasons instead of actual romantic reasons. You want to have the sort of partner that makes you look good. You're, and so that's a primary reason why you are dating or why you're attracted to someone. Is you know, so, so things in that zone, insecurity resulting in that kind of behavior. And then he goes on the show and learns a thing or two. Maybe I, I so I'm just making up a story based on what we saw. I'm, this is my fan fiction based of what was going on in his head that he starts to actually realize, huh, 
maybe I am a little superficial and maybe there is something there. And maybe I'll try this on for a bit, even though I'm not fully out of the woods in terms of my insecurities and my defenses. I'm going to try this this new thing on. I feel deeper. I feel more ph philosophical. Um, I you know I've I've I have this new thing that I'm trying on, and as he tries it on, he matures and he starts to say certain things, but it's not solid yet. He doesn't really he hasn't really explored it, and there are other issues going on in his personality that haven't really caught up, and so he temporarily says, "Well, she's really great, and but I don't like her. I know that." But she's really great, and there's no reason to kind of see this thing through, at least on the show. And, you know, I like being on the show because I'm insecure, and it makes me feel like maybe uh, I will feel better about myself once these things get published and everyone's looking at me. Maybe that'll bolster my self-esteem or something. And then, uh, and then throughout that time, while he's talking about being on the fence, he pretty much knows he's not. And he has to he has to be pent up, which he's not used to. He doesn't. He's not used to not disclosing himself as, and his urges to the world. So he's really uptight. And then when and then him and her have a conversation. He says, "Yeah, I'm pretty sure I'm a no." And she's like, "Okay, well, I'll, I'll be a no too then. I'll, and I'll just I'll just say no when they ask me. I'm going to say no." Okay. So then he says, "Okay, I am now released. I told her this is almost over." I just want to go back to my life, which is the way I used to live, which was immature and prestige, you know, low self-esteem based. And that's, you know, that that's that's my rhythm. That's what I'm used to. And now that she said, no, let's just go back there. Hey, party, party. And he has grown maybe a little bit. He had a few weeks there where he had tried on some new ways of thinking, but he was only halfway into it to begin with, and the other half was mildly an act. And now he's back to where he started with maybe an asterisk on his personality. <laughs> what do you think of that fan fiction? Let me know in the comments. <laughs> Did you think that's a, an accurate quote unquote fan, fan fiction? So, there's nothing more to say. That's my daughter. You gotta celebrate life. Yes. And I'll be happy. I chose myself. Let's celebrate Absolutely. That. I don't think he realizes what he just lost. And a little time from now, he's going to look back and realize that he lost the best thing of his life. A lot of us will say that when we get dumped, you know, <laughs> we'll often say, well, you know, they don't realize what they're passing up. And one day they'll regret it <laughs> because they will realize and I'm going to show them. I'm going to find an awesome partner and I'm going to Instagram the crap out of that thing. And then they're going to see it and they're going to be like, oh, I, I should never have dumped that person. You know, we all think that it's a, it's a consolation that we tell ourselves temporarily, I suppose. And that's fine. But I, I don't know if Shake's going to feel that way. I, there's not a, there's not a lot of evidence he's going to look back and go like, oh, darn, I should have been a different person. So, you know, but she's hurt, and uh, I'm really curious. We, we've heard a lot from Shake. I'm really curious how deep he feels about all this thing, you know, all this. How does she feel about I don't know if she can see the way he's behaving right now, but, you know, so given what we just saw right there, I'm, I'm guessing she's, you know, going through a lot, which would mean that Shake's way of dealing with this whole thing is, probably inconsiderate to her feelings and when that day comes I'll be long gone to me that's heartbreaking but I have to see my worth and move on he doesn't deserve me yeah and I, I often we often hear that kind of narrative uh, it's a I think it's a hurt angry perspective you know he doesn't deserve me In, instead of it's just like well he didn't like me and I liked him and that sucks and, and, and so Deep D can feel whatever she wants, but I, we use this as a jumping off point. Some of you right now might be going through a breakup. You might be in the process of being dumped or having been dumped by someone. It's painful, and that you are entitled to 100%. All the pain that you feel naturally and all the expressions of that pain and the talk and the tears and the grief, it can last forever. You can be dumped by someone and be affected by that grief literally 20 years, 30 years later. Research shows that. So that pain is real. It happens. It's natural. And it, there's no silver lining. It's, it's just pain. It just hurts. And 
there's that. But then we develop defenses against that, namely anger. And we try to protect ourselves from that pain by saying, well, I'm going to get revenge by showing them that they passed up on me. Or he doesn't deserve me, that you know, son of a bee. And it's natural to do that too, but it's not really serving the pain. It's not really tending to, oh, this, this sucks. Like, I really liked him. I really loved him. I, th- I thought he was great, but he didn't like me. He wasn't attracted to me. Ugh. You know, and having that space. So uh, to have an attitude of like, he doesn't deserve me. You know, I mean, I'm guessing you're not going to get a lot of arguments from the audience on that one. But I don't recommend that we have those kinds of points of view as we are. We tr- We try to... When I have clients going through this, let me just talk about clients. When I have clients going through this, I'll listen to them. I'm not going to shoot down a statement like that. But what I hear is pain, and so I will always redirect it to the pain. I'll be like, how are you feeling? Well, I sort of feel angry because he he passed up a good thing. And, you know, he's an SOB for not uh, giving it a try. And I'll be like, yeah, yeah, I hear you. Are you hurt? Do you feel pain? You know, I, I would just keep bringing it back to really the foundation of all of this, which is just the pain of some of rejection. So, I'm not saying it's deplorable to have that kind of attitude. It, it's just not the ultimate healing space. I'll just say that. Mallory Rose Zapata and Salvador Alviso Perez. So, someone apparently said that if me and Umberto had a child, they would look like Sal. And I completely agree with whoever said that. In fact, I've been thinking from the beginning that Sal could be my brother and uh, my younger brother, of course. <laughs> so, and, um, uh, but I often think that light brown men on these shows look like me, Armando included. <laughs> so, I, did. I mean, look at our eyebrows. You know, look at that. Eyebrows are very similar. <laughs> what do you think? Sal and I, younger brother. <laughs> yes. Salsa. <laughs> From the very moment I heard your voice, you felt like home. You've always made me feel comfortable, safe, and loved, even in the hardest moments when I didn't feel very lovable. You have helped me grow as a person and to be more vulnerable than I've ever been. Okay, so she just she just said something interesting. She said, you made me feel loved when I didn't feel lovable myself. Is she just saying, I didn't feel like I was going to find anyone, or does she inherently feel unlovable? Because we haven't seen vulnerability uh, from either one of them, really, on the show, which is fine. I mean, they can choose to not disclose what's going on inside of them like other characters, other cast members will. But I wonder what that means. I wonder if there's something going on there for her, some pain that she's going through. To have and to hold from this day forward, for better, for worse, to love and to cherish, as long as you both shall live? I cannot. <sighs> okay, yeah. I mean, it looked to me anyway, and I'm not there and I'm not inside their minds, but it certainly looked like Mallory just wasn't that into him. And I mean, she was, she kept saying she was. So let's see what she says here. I feel like I just need more time. It's okay. Okay, he says, I feel like I need more time. So maybe for him, he was ambivalent about her. We certainly didn't see any evidence of that, right? And she says, it's okay. It's okay. So we don't see her affected by that. But she, she doesn't seem to be affected by anything, really. And I don't know if that's just that she's just not affected by these particular things or if she's just generally kind of withdrawn emotionally. I don't know. So we just don't know because we've seen a pattern there. But if I was to hypothesize, I would say that she was definitely on the fence, if not going to say no herself. And then when he says no, she's like, it's, it's fine. It's totally, I was, I was going to say no <laughs> right if you didn't say no. Why does the, I don't understand the, I mean, it's, I guess, <laughs> why does the woman always walk away? Why, why don't they just both walk away? Or why doesn't the no walk away? Why is it always, it feels, I don't know, there's something kind of 
of course, you know, weddings have all sorts of heteronormative gendered, <laughs> traditional gender problems with it. You know, the, the man is at the altar while the father walks the possession from, you, you know, she is now, she was my possession and now she's your possession and here is your dowry. You know, it has all that pomp and circumstance. So, which is fine. Uh, I'm not saying it's horrible, but I don't know. Why does she, because when uh, Shake said no, right? No, no, no. Deep D said no. <laughs> and then she walked off. Anyway, I just, they should, I think they should just both walk, both depart. So I think a lot uh, will be revealed when we hear her side of things. If she's like, yeah, it's totally fine, you know, then we'll, we'll know that she was probably going to say no to, and he's probably saying no, because he seems way more affected by him saying no, that she's just like, okay, another day at the office, let's walk away. Now, that doesn't mean she's not feeling something on the inside. Let's find out. I feel like I just need to talk to Mallory's loved ones and family, like, I feel like I haven't had the time to meet a lot of you, and I just want to say, I know this was hard for all of you too. I can only give her my truest self and my most honest choice. That's why I said no today. So just contrast this reaction to Shake's. Now, of course, Shake did not say no. Deepti did, but the respect to the situation, I guess, um, is much different than we saw with Shake, right? Uh -huh. You good? Yeah, you good? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, her demeanor. Just like, a huge question I've been having is, does Mallory actually like Sal? Because it certainly doesn't look like it. And yet she kept saying she was into him. And so I don't want to say she was lying, but it just, it didn't feel like she was ever into him at all. You know, right from that first meeting when she first meets him and she's just like, oh, like... It would be very congruently satisfying to me if she were to be like, yeah, I, for a while now I've been questioning whether or not I wanted to be in this relationship. And so I'm totally cool. With, if he wasn't going to say, if he said yes, I probably would have said no. Let's see what she says. I feel like we said everything that we needed to say. I felt, I don't feel like anything's on my chest. In my heart, I knew that you weren't 100% sure. Honestly, Mel, like... I, I almost did mm -hmm. take that leap with you. Yeah. In that moment. Mm -hmm. Wait. So, uh, uh, their narrative is that she was a hundred percent sure, and everyone, the two of them, knew that he wasn't a hundred percent sure, and that she was going to say yes. He just revealed he was going to say no. And she's just totally emotionally fine with it. Like, hey, yeah, yeah, I totally understand. Like, no. <laughs> Now, I'm not saying she isn't having a, if that's true, that she isn't having a deep reaction, but it, so I'm just so, what do you think out there? Did Mallory ever like him? I don't know what I would have said if I would have went first. I'm not gonna lie, there's a part of me that like, maybe wanted you to say yes. Would you have said yes to me if I said yes? I might have. Okay, so at least that's getting closer to congruent, <laughs> but. I, the vibe that I was getting, and, you know, I'm just watching a reality TV show. They're just showing little snippets. It's edited. There's music, da-da-da. But I was expecting her to say, I was going to say no. <laughs> um, I had a fantasy, like, wouldn't it be nice? But then I, as soon as I thought about it, I was like, no, I'm just not into you, and I'm sorry. I haven't been for them. As soon as I saw you, you're a great-looking guy, but... I just didn't feel any chemistry with you, and I haven't. And I tried to make it work. It just never worked. And so, yeah, that's what I was. But she she makes it she makes it sound so nonchalant. Like, yeah, because he, he seems very invested. And this that's been kind of the theme of their relate. He when they talk and now included, he seems extremely invested and feeling. You know, like he's he's invested. He's like, this is real. This is the rest of our lives. She, the whole time, has seemingly just been, like, extremely nonchalant. Now, maybe that's just her demeanor. That's the way she comes across, and deep down she does feel what's happening. 
But I think more likely she just never felt it and either didn't want to admit it to herself or didn't want to admit it to the show or whatever, but, or was waiting for a spark to begin or something. But, you know, like that, when they're having that conversation about, and I don't think I showed this, but he had uh, an ex show up to his sister's place and was upset about something. And then Mallory was like, who was that woman? And Sal says, oh, it's a past partner of mine who, um, you know, he didn't say these words, but essentially she's disgruntled that I'm not with her anymore. But we never had a committed relationship. We both could see other people and did see other people. So I don't really know what she was upset about. And so to me, it was believable. There wasn't, I don't think there was any reason not to believe him, at least from what we saw. Maybe Mallory knew something different. But Mallory's reaction was, well, if this ever happens again, our wedding is off and this relationship is over. And I just thought like, whoa, what do you mean? So if he has some past partner who is upset that she's not with him, that he's not with her, then you're going to break up with him? Like, huh? <laughs> I just, I, I was like, am I missing something? But it all kind of fits into this thing of nonchalantness. And either she's just super chill or she's just not into this. She's not invested at all. And she might have a fantasy of like, well, maybe. But deep down she knows, no, I don't want to be with him. I don't know. It just, it just feels that way, doesn't it? I've really just, I've given 100% of myself. And... Like, just, I don't know. I was terrified of, like, putting myself out there and getting hurt, and I, I don't let a lot of people in. Okay. So we're starting to see some expression of emotion. And she says, I don't let a lot of people in. And she said earlier in the vows, I don't feel lovable all the time. So if it's true that she really was in love with him and really was invested maybe a lot more than what she was give you know revealing or expressing which is possible then why would that be well maybe she has relational traumas that resulted in her having a defense of seeming like she's a tough person and i've certainly seen a lot of people like that where they, they don't seem to be affected by anything, but they are deeply, deeply affected by everything. I'm, I'm not seeing a lot of evidence of that, but that would explain the incongruent reactivity to the whole situation. Do you take Ayana to be your lawfully wedded wife, to live together in the holiest state of matrimony, so long as you both shall live? I do, I do, I do. <laughs> Ah, oh, that's nice. So he's saying he does. And that's great. I was pulling for these two. They seem like a cute couple. They seem le very likable people from the beginning. And that's great. Uh, I, th I think they have some issues to work on, as all couples do. But, yeah, I could see it absolutely working for sure. To be your lawfully wedded husband, will you love him, comfort him, Honor and keep him so long as you both shall live. I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I I mean, I, I was pretty sure she was going to say I do. The way that she's been talking, even on the wedding day, it seemed pretty sure that she was going to say yes. So, all right. We have two couples that are getting married or that got married. And is that similar to the first season? <laughs> that out of five or six couples that made it to the end, two had a yes, yes. So it's great. And I, I'm guessing we're going to get a reunion and see how they're doing. I don't know. Let's find out. It just goes to show that love is truly blind. The best part? What's the best part? When she said yes. I was about to say when you said I do. Because <laughs> we're in it. For the long haul. Uh -huh. One and done. One and done. You can't take us nowhere. We're still gone. <laughs> I, I think part of my hopes for Ayana is that she reminds me of the women in my family, she, like my sister and my cousins and others. She she just 
there's a familiarity that I feel to her, the, their mannerisms or attitude or something. And so just that little thing that she just like that, like, I don't know, I feel like the women in my family would have done something like that. <laughs> anyway, they're a really cute couple. It's really great to see. All right, well, that does it for that episode of Psychology in Seattle. Everyone out there, please take care of yourself because you deserve it. You really, really do.